Hi, I'm here with Daryl and Cindy Joseph. Cindy, welcome. Welcome to The Woe Show. We're happy to have you. Cindy is a former makeup artist expert. Uh, she traveled the world with top photographers and top fashion models. And yet, all along, I think I read in your profile, Cindy, that in high school you sort of rejected the whole premise of making up and looking a certain way, yet you went right into the industry in which you were rebelling. I think uh, probably my guess is that you wanted to make a statement. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. Cindy went on to be a model herself, irony of ironies, which is hilarious. And now she has a, a blog, she has her own skincare line, and she is a pro-ager, in her own words, a pro-ager. So, Cindy, this is just fascinating. You just are like a, a, a bunch of contradictions um, <laughs> with, your, with your chosen career. Well, I'm a woman, so of course. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. How did, that, how did that all? How did that all work out for you? I mean, how did you end up on this on this path of uh, contradictions in beauty, yet working against the industry in a sense? Not against, but pro aging. Yeah, when I was a young woman, I was in high school, and like so many girls in high school, you know, we're trying to navigate, you know, everything that's going on around us and everything that's going on inside of us. And I had it that I was not right. The way I was and I would you know was attracted to fashion magazines and beauty which was really an attraction to other women and girls and looking for archetypes and looking for um, something to follow looking for examples and then looking to friends and and wanting to be connected to my peers and I think ultimately it's about connection but of course this is in my wisdom today back then I didn't have a clue what was going on who knew? Who knew in high school? Who knew? Yeah. And, you know, twiggy and fake eyelashes and right. hair and, you know, big hair and makeup and the whole thing was definitely the theme of the day. But there were other things going on bubbling underneath in society, but they hadn't quite come, gotten to the forefront yet. So I was just busy having a good time and playing dress up with my friends and it was all about makeup not only because it was fun to just play I mean I was wearing two pair of fake eyelashes to high school every day Wow you know I, I was into it <laughs> I know that's what everybody asks it's like I don't know but I did the little tease up here you oh know, gosh like the beehive, the beehive. I didn't quite go to the beehive but I envied those girls for sure and had the little spit curls and oh, the yeah. bow here <laughs> and let me tell you the makeup was intense it was full foundation and then we had white lips. Do you remember the white yes, lips? Yes, I used totally to use do. Eraser. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Use eraser. Oh yes, exactly. Uh -huh. And then the dark line up here, and the very precise eyebrows. I mean, it was crazy, and it, there was a lot of fun to it. You know, hanging out with my friends and making them up and everything. Little did I know, I was developing skills, actual skills to apply makeup towards somebody rather than towards myself, which is a part of being a makeup artist and learning about all the different products, all the different textures, colors, and all of that. However, a big part of my motivation was trying to look like something I was not. Yes. Trying to hide the flaws and fix everything and try to look exactly like that girl on the latest cover. And then as these other things that were going on in the 60s that were bubbling under the surface, you know, we, the society, young people were starting to rebel against what was going on in the government, you know, Vietnam War, in society in general, um, really questioning the values that we were given and then we were rejecting. And I was looking at the whole world of beauty and self-esteem and, and the messages that were being sent to us as young women. And it really was about trying to fit into a mold, into an American beauty ethic that you had to be tall, thin, blonde. You know, I've, there were so many different dictates back then that have changed to now, but I felt like I had to fit into that mold or I wasn't going to get the goodies. That my looks were my currency and that I had to pay with my currency to get what I wanted in life. If it be, you know, the husband and the kids in the house or being, you know, 
respected and popular at school or whatever it was that you had to be a certain way and I said enough that's for the birds that's old that's archaic and it's over and I had already developed all those skills in makeup and I thought well this is gonna continue I need to get in I need to infiltrate I'm gonna become the underground in fashion and beauty <laughs> right because I knew that people wouldn't listen to me unless I was an expert you know I had to get the credibility so it was interesting when I started doing makeup professionally and started getting the big jobs and and working for the big magazines they would they would ask me for makeup tips like what do girls that wear glasses do how do they do their eye makeup so they look pretty with glasses on so it was like number one who said wearing glasses wasn't pretty number two what's wrong with your eyes the way they are you know like what is attractiveness really about so I would I just managed to answer those questions by kind of working around them and telling the truth about what beauty really was and oh hey if you want to have some fun with some lipstick and some mascara and stuff great but you don't need it it's something to do for fun so all these more subtle messages I was able to get through by being the makeup expert and it's continued on interesting so yeah. when, you, when you take that premise from when you were a young woman to and the whole premise of having to look a certain way and having to you know um, keel into the to the dictates of what what is beautiful and what is not if you kind of move that forward to now and how women at midlife feel that they are no longer able to look a certain way and they struggle to look younger they struggle to be again fit into this mold I mean what is your observation good question I'm fascinated that here we are in 2013 women got the vote and got into the workforce a hundred years ago 45 years ago we were liberated we burned our bras we said we're taking the same jobs as men we're gonna we're we're there we have arrived and now we've ran for president we're running huge corporations creating businesses I mean we've arrived and everybody sees it everybody experiences it but deep down inside each woman do we really believe it I, it's like there's this peace that's still tucked in our psyche that we are living by and that is we are not valuable unless we are either in our childbearing years or we at least look like it well you know it's funny because as you talked about when you were talking about the currency that you believed when you were younger I was thinking well I, I really think that's no different today you know that still exists for young girls in high school today who believe that they're they need that currency which is one of the reasons I think women so fear getting older that we're gonna lose that currency it's very pervasive I'm, I'm curious as somebody who really um, the one part of your story you didn't tell and it, in a way it's kind of appropriate that your name is Cindy because it's a real Cinderella story um, <laughs> <laughs> you know Cindy was um, here's a story so Cindy's walking down the street in New York where she's a makeup artist she's approached by a talent scout for Dolce & Gabbana who say hey you know how would you like to be a model and she goes, okay, the kicker of the story is that this happens when Cindy is 49 years old. Yeah. At the time when no models are working anymore. So you have really experienced a very unusual, you know, at the time when all of a sudden you're being handed currency or, or you know, this feeling that, um, the average woman is really struggling with at 49. That is a real age of struggle for for many women right okay so number one I was in photo studios all day every day from age 28 on nobody ever asked me to model I was approached on the street that day because I had silver hair crow's feet and I was clearly an older woman which they were looking for because advertising has finally caught up and realized guess what we're over 50 and we are alive and we yes. are buying stuff and we are totally in the world of consumption 
you know, women don't want to stop consuming after 50. Well, we're the biggest consumers. I mean, certainly of the makeup. I've read that women, the older you get, we buy more of the makeup because we feel the need more and we have more money. I mean, and we're a larger demographic. So we buy everything that they buy and sometimes more. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I would like to see our demographic purchasing not more makeup, but purchasing the things that, you know, bring us the fun and the juice and the activity and, and the challenges in life. Because then we're going after things out of passion rather than going after things out of fear. If you're grabbing the anti-wrinkle right. cream and the anti-stuff and trying to hide your age, you are being motivated by fear and desperation. And I don't think that's ever attractive. I think what's attractive is a really happy woman. Now, if you're doing all those things because it's fun and you like playing dress up, great. It's going to work. You, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, so, absolutely. So I and think, I think that, uh, what, I think, uh, Cindy, what's interesting too is, is I think you and I were talking about this uh, before, that if you wear makeup every day, a certain kind of, of complete coverage or whatever, right? that you never recognize yourself or you don't like the way you look when you don't have makeup on so you really don't know how you look so because your natural state is not okay is that oh, absolutely when I was doing the two pair of fake eyelashes in high school I was like what's gonna happen if I meet somebody I wanna marry I'm gonna have to wake up before them get all my makeup done not let them see me like I am because I really had it that I was no good without it and I was just perfect with it and Luckily, that was, you know, just like youthful insanity. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God for getting older. Thank God for getting wiser and smarter and more experienced and really seeing how it is. And I have total compassion and understanding for my sisters because we all grew up in the same society that, that you know, it gets into us in really subtle ways. It's not that we woke up one day and someone said, hey, you need to look way younger than you are or you're not going to have fun and you're not going to have a great life. Just like nobody tells you, if you get on a bus and there's only one person sitting on that bus, don't go sit next to them. That would be really uncool. We get that message subtly. It's like comes through us, you know, in in in, in a uh, n not an overt way, but a, in a covert way. I'm stumbling over my words here. Yeah, I get so excited talking about these things because I think it's so important to be in this discussion because we all feel it, we all know it, and it is happening everywhere. I mean, that's why the beauty industry is worth billions. I mean, they are making not millions but billions of dollars off of our fears yes so what do you so you're you're uh, being a, approached by Dolce and Gabbana for a modeling gig and to start your modeling career at 49 uh, you said that you thought that finally these brands are starting to appreciate the fact that women spend money after 50 and and they're wanting to demonstrate that through their advertising and such but that's not necessarily the standard I mean that is bubbling as you said I mean what do you think we can do to start changing the face of women sort of rebranding women at mid-age so to speak what do you think we can do to change the conversation oh boy well advertisers respond to what the public is doing the boomers the generation over 48 years old is it 48 now or 50 about yeah okay so our demographic the baby boomers everybody knows who we are we have reinvented every decade of our lives. When we were in our 20s, we were doing things that nobody in their 20s did before, as well as in our 30s, our 40s, and now our 50s, 60s, and 70s. We are reinventing the face of aging. And that's why the advertisers are putting women like me into advertising. So that's actually the way it works. So we've already decided that we rock at the age that we are. We are, you know, teaching <laughs> yoga. We are running marathons. We are not sitting on the porch watching our grandkids play soccer. We are playing soccer with them. 
See, I think that what you say, it A, it really reflects what we're trying to do here by with Woe. And I also think that what you describe is actually very true. It's a grassroots thing. I mean, it starts with each woman. And if you, it's like you said, we're Bingo. here and we know how it feels. And so if you project that, you know, I think that what you know what we're looking at right now is sort of a critical mass and a tipping point is coming because yes. women do get it we're here I think yes. the people below us they're afraid they don't get it but it's a lot of that we get it because we're here we we experience it we're projecting that and I think that the world it feels to me that the world is beginning to wake up to what you feel when you get here and I think that's where it starts Yes, you hit it exactly. It's critical mass, and it happens with each woman. It's Inside. an inner right. process. Yes, exactly. So as each one of us suddenly realize, wow, I mean, were, did you ever have that sensation like you were waiting for the other shoe to drop as you started aging? Like, okay, when is it all going to end? When is it going to be over? When am I going to fall apart? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, and then you realized, oh, I'm getting better. <laughs> right? It's true. It's right? true. No, so, I, yeah. Then you are the example. So it happens one woman at a time. And as each woman has that aha moment and goes, oh, life is rocking. I am healthier, happier, sexier, more fulfilled, more gratified, wiser, have more self knowledge than ever before. And I always well, talk about, and it does ahead. take that commitment, right? That it, it, we talked about this earlier as well. That personal commitment that each person makes to not, you know, cave into the the so-called norms and to live their lives authentically. I remember yeah. this is a long time ago now, but I will never forget this: that I was driving through the Tenderloin, which is a a, a, low, a much a, a dangerous, weird neighborhood in San Francisco, and I saw this woman. She had to have been in her late seventies, walking down the street, dressed well but not you know finally but well all by herself and I thought she was a soccer mom you know she had children she went to the grocery store she was at the PTA and what what when did she fall off the cliff when did she have to like move to an, a neighborhood like this in order to survive why is she invisible oh it, it, oh it, I see what you're saying so it bugged so you, me then it must, okay, it must have been literally 15 years, 20 years ago when I didn't have to really worry about all this, uh, you know. But, but I will never forget her. And at that point, I thought that is not okay. That is not okay, right? So, well, that's something wow. actually that Suzanne Braun Levine describes in her book that a lot of women of our generation had this fear. It's called the bag. She calls it the bag lady yes. syndrome. Yeah. Um, which is a whole other. Yeah. You know, side of of getting older. Um, I would like to say though that I think when when you say Cindy oh this is the best time I mean I think that you know to be realistic I I have plenty of days when I look in the mirror no makeup and I'll say oh my god what happened here call the plastic surgeon you know which I'm you know I'm not doing but I think that part of what when people say it's great at this age I think part of what it is is that you you begin to really understand what's most important and that those things that you were so focused on that the outer stuff is not as important as the inner stuff so even though and you're just more able to accept things you're a survivor you've been through so much and I think there's you know that's part of what makes it I think wonderful at this age because you're accepting more of yourself hallelujah <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah and I believe and I see and I experience that women want to be noticed, flirted with, cared about, worshipped, heard, and not overlooked for their entire life, not just Absolutely. part of their life. So the message that comes is we're going to become invisible, we're going to become forgotten, and there is proof that that actually happens. Right, right. And I think that that's that's the part where we're like kind of how do we how do we deal with this? But the funny thing is, is we actually know. You know, when the fear comes up is when we doubt ourselves, but when we suddenly know through experience. So all of our lives. When we meet somebody, we notice the facade, the superficial things. It could be the color of the hair, the shape of the body, the jewelry, whatever, on another woman. 
And as soon as you start talking to her and getting to know her, all of that stuff disappears and you start experiencing her essence, her personality, her body language and all that stuff disappears and and we see it in everybody else and we know that none of the surface stuff matters with our girlfriends, our mothers, our daughters, our nieces, our friends, our neighbors but when we look in the mirror that tends to be the first thing we see and then the only thing we see yeah. Because we're not interacting with ourselves and seeing our essence. So I say cover the mirrors. Forget about that superficial stuff. You know, like get in your body. I mean, groom yourself, obviously, you know, clean and take care of your body. But <laughs> the, the makeup and the, you know, the wave of the hair and all those things that we think are so important. Nobody sees that. You know why? Because they're so busy thinking about what they look like. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly true. You know, I actually, I have some funny stories about that involving breast cancer because, you know, I'm a survivor. And um, when I first had, I first had a mastectomy and I was young, I was in my mid forties and I lost one breast. And so I remember going and I was so focused on that. I really, and I had a fake, so I couldn't have reconstruction. So I was so focused that, you know, everybody could see this. And I will never forget this one night I went to a party and I was, you know, had a great time and about almost at the end of the party I was standing there talking to a friend and we were talking she was asking how I was doing and I felt I realized oh my god I had forgotten to wear the extra the fake boob and no one had noticed the whole night I mean it just shows you that you know I once your people really do focus we are the ones that create this you know we are the ones that created in ourselves we're so hyper conscious and um, but again oh Daryl that's I, hilarious I know I know <laughs> nobody oh, noticed it I mean I know what my did you do what did you do did you go I went I went to the bathroom and I stuffed some toilet paper in there you know and, and that was it you know but again it really got me over a hump of some kind it made me realize yeah, good how you. unimportant that was and today you know, today, actually, I don't wear any fakes. I had the other one taken off. I don't wear anything. And really, people who know me well, because I'll wear a scarf and I wear different, nobody notices. You know, I mean, people yeah. go, really? You don't have, you know, I never noticed. And, right. but I think that's because I'm projecting, I'm okay with this. Right. You know, that's what right. I'm putting out there. Right. Well, also, what's more important? I mean, if they were there, I mean, how much attention would be spent on your breasts? It's like, right. you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like what we're talking about, what we're doing, what we're being challenged by, the things that really, really matter. Um, I have stood in uh, like the bathroom of a, of a restaurant waiting, you know, to go in the stall and I watch the women in front of the mirror oh, and they'll look in the mirror that. and they're like, this grimace. And then they see one hair, and then they right. go like that, and then suddenly they get this look of joy, and off they go as happy as can be. Nobody anywhere is going to notice that one hair. However, it made her happy. Mm -hmm. So then she looked a thousand times better because she finally felt good about being inside of her body. She thought that so, made all the difference. That one hair made her look different than she did. Well, have exactly. you heard about that? So, have you heard about? Oh, go ahead. I was. Well, say. I just wanted to say that you know. So, if you're going to do Botox or get the facelift, or you're just going to fix that one hair, or you're just going to wash your face and be free of all that stuff because you feel better like that, what makes you look better is not all those things. It's because you feel better. Right. Feeling good is what makes you look good. Yeah. Bottom well, I've mind. I've always felt you know too that, and I've always noticed that. People sometimes, when they believe they're beautiful, we all believe they're beautiful. I mean, some of the people yeah. that we think of as the most beautiful, if you line them up, you know, it's coming from what they project, the confidence and the, the inner stuff that they're projecting out there. And there are some beautiful women that are not thought of as beautiful, and a lot of it is just the lack of what they're projecting. But to get back to some of what we were talking about in the beginning about the media, um, I'm curious because you obviously um, are very involved, you know, in the media and the, 
the advertising and that sort of thing. So what's your feeling about what the average, you know, I mean, if you think things are starting to change, what would you advise for the average person or do you think it's a, it is this critical mass that each person, um, the more we each feel okay with aging and project that out there, eventually that's what will be accepted by society, by the culture, because, you know, I think people think of older, older women as adorable, you know, in their late 80s, Betty White, but there's a lot of years between 50 and Betty White that were, were, in, that, were in that place. And so what do you imagine, what would you see as the way things would go that, that would make it feel... Um, you know, something that you would think that would be great for all of us, for society oh, I can't, I can't that we were on. That answer. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, number one, staying in conversation about it is really important. Unloading your stress, your fears, your feelings, and sharing these ideas like we are here. Being in conversation is is how things start to happen. And I think also admitting our own ageism against ourselves yes you know I did it in high school I was actually being mean to myself I was judging myself so critically and thinking I had to fix myself so we experience it on a different level all the way through life but as you get older you know there's just a whole bunch more stuff you can pile on yourself you know this isn't right and that's not right and it's getting old and realizing that our society has clearly given us a message from day one that we are going to lose value as we look older. Exactly. And yes. that that is 100% make-believe. Mm -hmm. So be compassionate towards yourself that you have a lot of tender feelings in that area and you don't want to disappear and you don't want to have to make a choice of either doing every single thing you can to keep yourself up or just let yourself go. One of those women that have just let themselves go, that you have a myriad of choices between those two extremes. Right. You know? Yeah, and, that the, and that the messages we have been receiving that has created this ageism are make-believe make-believe it's you can just disappear like pixie dust as soon as you change your mind the only thing we really have complete control over is our viewpoint so take a look at all the choices you have to choose from for your own viewpoint well, that is when so you're, perfectly said i i mean is. really that I'm was good. you know that's exactly <laughs> i think what yeah and i and i think that awesome. boy you are pro ager is the perfect term to describe you, I, I think that when I talk to someone later today and say I, I met with, uh, you know, make a former makeup artist and model Cindy Joseph, I think I might say I met with pro ager Cindy Joseph first before all the other descriptors because you're amazing. We would love to have you back because you are so Thank articulate you. and so right on with uh, with reflecting what we're trying to um, put out there. Just love it. Thank you so much, and please come back and join us. I'll be back. Thank you so much. It was a blast. Thanks, Cindy.